Good evening and welcome to all of you who have gathered here this evening uh, for our annual Trocra Lecture and also all of you who join us online uh, and uh, to this talk that's jointly uh, sponsored by Trocra and St. Patrick's College Maynooth. Our blended format allows us to reach a wider audience and so especially I welcome those of you who have joined us from around the country and indeed globally. In both the encyclical Laudato Si, published, hard to believe, nine years ago, and its addendum, Laudato Deum, published last year, Pope Francis has underlined the interconnectedness of everything. Poverty, economic, social, and technological issues. He also laments that responses to a global crisis of climate change have led to a greater individualism rather than an increased solidarity. In his view, societies have failed to respond to the crises that are profoundly interrelated, global inequality, pollution, and even new forms of artificial intelligence. At the root of the Earth's interlocking crises, the Pope urged in 2015 and again in 2023 uh, that really is that it is a denial of the fact that all life exists in relationships. Climate change is a, a complex global reality that, that many try to deny or simplify by blaming others, notably developing societies, rather than recognizing their own role. And the earth is not confronting a variety of separate crises, Francis says, but rather one complex crisis with many faces. And in his new document, he reinforces this idea, stressing that climate concerns are about more than ecology, because care for the earth and care for one another are intimately connected. And the way out of the current environmental crisis, the Pope suggested in his message through Cardinal Parolin to COP28, is the way of togetherness and multilateralism. And he called for effective cooperation in a world that has become so multipolar and at the same time so complex that a different framework for effective cooperation is required. It is disturbing, he noted, that global warming has been accompanied by a general cooling of multilateralism, a growing lack of trust within the international community, and he underscored the crucial role of trust in rebuilding effective international collaboration and relationships in response to these various crises. So we are, I'm delighted this evening on behalf of the college and and also Trokra, to welcome our guest speaker, uh, Father Orobator, a former president of the Jesuit Conference of Africa at Madagascar and current dean of the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara University in California. And that context that we set sets the framework for the subject of this evening, climate justice and uh, social teaching. Everything is connected and no one is saved alone, which is the subject that he will address this evening and is perhaps very qualified and, uh, to do so this evening. A very distinguished theologian, uh, and I'm delighted to say Quiva will introduce him in a moment, but uh, distinguished, he's graduated from, with a PhD in theology from a University of Leeds in England, an MBA from Georgetown University, a licentiate, uh, and also from the Hakima University a College in Nairobi, Kenya, and also from the Institute de Philosophia de Saint-Pierre Canisius in Kinshasa, Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He's widely published in a variety of areas of theology and we're delighted that he is here to address this topic, uh, this very prescient topic this evening of climate justice and Catholic social teaching. Everything is connected and no one is saved alone. So you're very welcome and uh, I invite Quiva de Barra now to, uh, the, uh, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And you're all very welcome here this evening again, whether you're here in person or joining us online. So the topic for this evening's lecture is very important for Trokra for two reasons that are fundamental. The first one is that Catholic social teaching is the life force of Trokra. It is what we are founded on. It is what we live and breathe every day in our values, in our behaviors, in our work with our local partners. The second is that climate change or climate injustice 
is the biggest threat facing the communities and people that we work with at the moment and has been for many years. It's actually over 15 years since Trokra first launched a major campaign on climate justice. In 2008, we came out with our biggest campaign to date on the issue of climate justice. Much has changed in those last 15, 16 years, but one of the most important things that has changed is the fact that we now have more voices of moral clarity, such as the voice of Father Orobator and, of course, of Pope Francis, which both gives us hope and inspiration and makes our work easier in some ways, but in the face of a growing crisis, the scale of which I think we can only begin to imagine. Behind you, you can see a picture of a woman, Melita, and her children, Patrick and Patricia, who are from Malawi. Malawi is a country that is being devastated by the impact of climate change. Malawi has the lowest per capita carbon emissions in the world. Ireland, by contrast, has the third highest in Europe. So I think the topic of justice and climate justice has never been more important. We see the impact of it on communities that we work in every day, and we are delighted to have an opportunity to ask Father Orobator to share with us his thoughts on Catholic social teaching and climate justice. Everything is connected and no one is saved alone. So Father Orobator was born in Nigeria. He's the former president of the Jesuit Conference of Africa and Madagascar. He was provincial superior of the Eastern Africa province, which includes Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Sudan, and South Sudan, all of which are countries that Trokra currently works in or has worked in. Father Orobator is author and editor of a number of books, most recently Religion and Faith in Africa, Confessions of an Animist, and he's currently the dean of the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University in Berkeley, California. Father Orobator, thank you so much. Whom the gods would destroy, the first make mad. 75 years ago, the United Nations General Assembly enshrined the care for the dignity of fellow human beings in universal, non-negotiable, and inalienable human rights as the foundation of peace, freedom, and justice in the world. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights aligns closely with the fundamental tenets of Catholic social teaching at the core of which is the commitment to the dignity of the human person created in the likeness and image of God and the belief in our innate dignity or the sacredness of life. In the view of Pope Leo XIII, the founder of modern Catholic social teaching, the appeal to the dignity of the human person constituted a powerful moral idiom that surpasses considerations of race, of creed, of ethnicity, of class, of gender, of geography for any human society if it is to be well-ordered and productive. Each individual, Leo XIII explained, quote, is truly a person endowed with rights and duties that are universal and inviolable and therefore altogether inalienable. That is to say, human beings did not require extraneous warrants to be valued, protected, and respected. Yet, we seem to have overlooked the glaring facts in the opening pages of the Judeo-Christian sacred text that gave rise in the first place to this belief in the inviolability of human dignity, namely, 
the equally intriguing understanding of dignity as a shared endowment. In fact, dignity is actualized in a horizontal relationship that situates human beings in a shared universe. Now, at the risk of evoking the specter of pantheism, a more accurate reading of the biblical texts should deliver the conclusion that all creation, all creation is made in the image and likeness of God. In other words, as Francis declares in Laudato Si and Laudate Deum, quote, the universe unfolds in God who fills it completely, end quote. This mystical link between human beings and their natural environment is a staple of Francis's teaching on climate justice, to which I will return shortly. Now, given this fundamental idea that Francis poetically describes, quote, as the mysticism of gratuitousness that loves life as a gift, the mysticism of a sacred wonder before nature and all its forms, end quote, we cannot but lament a certain distortionist tendency within Abrahamic religion's philosophy of dominion and exploitation of nature, which conflicts, I would say, with the understanding of Catholic social teaching. Pope John Paul II, in Solicitude Res Socialis, taught that, quote, the dominion granted human beings by the creator is not an absolute power to do as one pleases or the freedom to use and misuse as one pleases. The limitation imposed from the beginning by the creator shows clearly enough that when it comes to the natural world, we are subject not only to biological laws, but also to moral ones, which cannot be violated with impunity, end quote. Against the backdrop of the catastrophic consequences of unrestrained power to use and to misuse the gift of creation, the prophetic voice of Pope Francis rings loud and clear. Everything is connected, and no one is saved alone. As we say in Africa, if one finger touches oil, it soils the others. Whatever touches creation touches us all. Now back to Catholic social teaching. From Paul VI, we know that Catholic social teaching provides us principles of reflection, norms of judgment, and directives for action. And we know that Catholic social teaching embodies a historical reality that unfolds in time as an intellectual tradition that seeks to analyze social and economic realities from the perspectives of faith. As Paul VI stated in 1971, Catholic social teaching, quote, has been worked out in the course of history. Besides, Catholic social teaching is a living tradition, not a fixed and closed body of teaching, but a living tradition anchored in philosophical and theological traditions which are themselves rooted in biblical revelation. Equally, Catholic social teaching is culturally contextualized. It is shaped and grounded by and in real life situations of people in their diverse regions 
and circumstances. Now, we might wonder, what has Catholic social teaching got to do with climate justice? Everything, everything. As a historical reality, a living tradition, and a culturally contextualized body of thought, Catholic social teaching is quintessentially a holistic pedagogy of justice. Now, in classical theories of justice, at least in Western intellectual traditions, I noticed a tendency to prioritize contractual and transactional relationship of individuals to one another and between them and their society. Now, in contrast, Catholic social teaching offers an expanded approach that considers the moral value of humans' relationship to their environment and how such relationship in turn determines and affects for good or for ill the quality of life and the dignity of human beings, including their communities, their societies, their economies, and their politics. However we choose to define justice, it is woefully incomplete if it discounts the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of people of this age, especially those who are poor, people who inhabit and depend on this open-ended environment we call nature. In this context, I believe, justice makes full sense to the extent that it encompasses human beings in their existential relationship with the natural world and their virtuous behavior towards their environment. A sense of justice requires the acceptance of what society morally owes nature. Therefore, as Francis argues in Laudate Deum, either we treat other creatures of this world as our companions along the way, or they become instead our victims. But Francis advocates for an urgently needed broader perspective to enable present generation to assume responsibility that we will leave behind once we pass away from this world. Previously in Laudato Si, he identified a tripartite framework consisting of a sound ethics, a culture, and a spirituality. And I believe that such a framework envisions a robust notion and practice of climate justice that steer clear of transactional horse trading that so often characterizes international efforts to address climate change. Climate justice grounded in a tripartite ethical framework, such as advocated by Francis in the tradition of Catholic social teaching, offers a vision of an ethics of solidarity and compassion, a culture of care and encounter, and a spirituality of mutuality and safeguarding. This vision is not utopian. It is achievable, as I hope to demonstrate in the course of this lecture. Additionally, though, I want to make the claim that as a foundation of climate justice, such a tripartite ethical framework is best envisioned as an ecological Ubuntu. Now, I mean by ecological Ubuntu, a moral universe where interdependence constitutes the basis not only for assessing the ethical implications of mutuality and relationality among people, 
institutions and nations, but also for fulfilling the accountability towards nature and how that accountability is a source of moral imperatives at local and at global levels. What I propose as an ecological Ubuntu seeks to achieve one objective, namely to correct what John Paul II criticized as an anthropological error in Centesimus Annus, and Francis denounced as misguided anthropocentrism in Laudato Si. Now, these two fallacies, I contend, conflate into a formidable technocratic paradigm that gives the impression, as Francis says, quote, of a human being with no limits, whose abilities and capabilities can be infinitely expanded thanks to technology and the economy, end quote. Now, in light of these considerations, what specific principles can we draw from Catholic social teaching to broaden, to deepen, to strengthen the moral scaffolding of climate justice? There are many. But by way of example, I mention three. The first principle is a preference of love for the poor, which draws us with particular urgency to the side of those who are deprived of justice and robbed of human dignity. In the expansive view of Catholic social teaching, this preference, this preference has to be expressed in a worldwide dimension. Embracing the immense numbers of the hungry, the needy, the homeless, those without medical care, and those without hope. As such, in Catholic social teaching, we notice poverty no longer simply refers to hapless human byproducts who inhabit the peripheries and perilous margins of socioeconomic inequalities and inequities. Poverty is the visceral condition of planet Earth. Hence, Pope Francis claims that the cry of the poor is the cry of the Earth. And further, that we are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other, but with one complex crisis, at once social and environmental. Like the poor, he teaches, the earth is broken, the earth is wounded. And both are threatened by misguided, reckless, and unchecked human intervention on nature. Accordingly, I would argue, a preference of love must guide us with heightened resolve to the side of the earth, our home, and to the side of people and communities who suffer the consequences of its devastations, such as we find in a place like Malawi. In light of this principle, can climate justice be just if we simply settle for the lowest common denominator of to everyone his or her due? While we may all be buffeted by the same atmospheric calamities, we know that we are definitely not ensconced in the same boat. If there is one truth, that Catholic social teaching has revealed with such compelling clarity, it is precisely that climate change affects people and communities unequally. Their relative capacity for mitigation, adaptation, 
and coping with severe losses and damages is calibrated along an axis of disproportionality that privileges the haves at the expense of the have-nots. That is, people and communities who carry the heaviest burden for climate change outcomes for which they bear the least responsibility. The second principle is the paramountcy of the common good. Many of us would know this, that our basic catechism teaches us that, quote, common good is the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment fully and more easily, end quote. By implication, it is a necessary function of climate justice to take into account people and their communities, their social well-being, and their need for a safe and secure environment where humanity and society can flourish. The logic of this deduction is, is quite simple, and it is compelling. It is this that no good, no good is more common than our common home. No good is more common than our common home. As Paul VI stated in Populorum Progressio, quote, the world is given to all, not only to the rich, end quote. My third principle is the urgency of solidarity. John Paul II, to return to him again, proposed a timeless description of solidarity. He said, and I quote, solidarity is not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortune of so many people, both near and far. On the contrary, it is a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. That is to say, the good of all and the good of each individual, because we are truly responsible for all, he said, end quote. Solidarity then is the capacity, he adds, to recognize others as persons. As I see it, the opposite of solidarity is not indifference, it is impassibility. The absence of solidarity is not lack of attention, but an absence of affection. Because I believe that solidarity is the human capacity to be affected by conditions of others and the necessary imperative to act. Curiously, over several centuries, human beings have honed their capacity to affect their natural environment for good or for ill. And I would ask, who, who but the truly mad can doubt the human entropic origin of climate change? The stridency of naysayers and deniers cannot spin the stark facts. The hockey stick graph is neither a myth nor a hoax. We have reliable records of two millennia of climate history pointing to the prodigious human capacity to affect, to alter, to influence climate and natural environment systematically and deliberately through a collective set of activities. We, we need not look too far to perceive the frightening impact human activity is having on our climate. Forest trees do fall on occasion, but they never fell themselves, never. High-density urban centers do not miraculously 
emerge from the bottom of the sea any more than fossil fuels can self-extract and self-ignite. Our capacity to affect our environment may be ambivalent, but it's neither neutral nor innocuous. Besides the triumphs of earth-altering, accelerated human, technological, and scientific ingenuity lie the nefarious effects, the nefarious debris of man-made alteration of ecosystems, including climate, global warming, loss of biodiversity, and forced displacement of people. I believe that our present ecological predicament is a self-inflicted calamity. The gods, the gods are not to blame. As Francis laments, and I quote, never have we so hurt and mistreated our common home as we have in the last 200 years, end quote. Be that as it may. My point, my point is that climate justice entails a radical conversion from mindlessly affecting the earth to consciously being affected by the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. The capacity to be moved lies at the core of who we are. The capacity to be moved within lies at the core of who we are. And lacking, lacking this ecological affect, we are liable and culpable silent witnesses to terrible climate injustice. Preference of love for the poor, paramountcy of the common good, an urgency of solidarity resembles for me a three-legged stool on which sits climate justice. And what do these moral principles have in common? At the very least, they presume a basic sociality, interdependence, and mutuality of existence. They teach us that as long as we remain on this earth, we are all connected. Because climate justice precludes, as Vatican II teaches, a merely individualistic morality. I propose, therefore, that these principles form the pillars of an ecological Ubuntu and the elements of an urgently needed broader ethical framework for climate justice, as Francis teaches. So, what about ecological Ubuntu? Three years before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Belgian missionary to the Congo, Father Placid Tempels, he declared, and I quote, the Bantu cannot conceive of the human person as an independent being standing on their own. Every human being, every individual is, as it were, one link in a chain, a chain of vital forces. Living link both exercising and receiving influence, a link that establishes the bond with previous generations and with the forces that support their own existence, end quote. Although decades separates them, this declaration resonates loudly with Francis's insistence that there is a dynamic connection between human beings and their environment, that we are part of the universe. All of us are linked by unseen bonds, and together we form a universal family. So you see, ecological Ubuntu 
is another name for this vital and inseparable nexus between human ecology and environmental ecology, between anthropology and ecology. The earth, our common home, Francis contends, it's really a rich tapestry of life woven from so many strands of human life, a biodiversity of flora and fauna, an ecosystem of natural phenomena. And therefore, he, decried, he declares, we're all related. Everything in the world is connected. We're dependent on one another. We're a universal family. We're part of, you, of, of nature, included in it, and thus in constant interaction with nature. Essentially, this means, as he tells us in Querida Amazonia, attacks on nature have consequences for people's lives, especially the most vulnerable. And he continues in Laudato Si, and I quote, that the impact of climate change will increasingly prejudice the lives of families and of many persons. We will feel the effects of climate change in the areas of healthcare, sources of employment, access to resources, housing, forced migration, etc. end quote. This, fine, this vital connection, foregrounded by ecological Ubuntu, serves as a strong anchor for climate justice. Not only does a fundamental bond exist between human beings and their environment, the ethical dimensions of such bondedness should inform, shape, and determine choices, policies, actions at personal, community, societal, national, and international levels, especially actions that are aimed towards mitigating the burden of climate change on the poor and the vulnerable. Because again, the agony of the earth is the anguish of humanity. The fate of the earth is the burden of the poor. As we have witnessed across the world, the frequency and intensity of extreme and unprecedented weather phenomena, such as heat waves and, and wildfires and atmospheric flooding, prolonged drought, snowstorms, desertification, they are all symptomatic of what Francis diagnoses as a silent disease of climate change that affects everyone. And as Francis would add, and I quote, our relationship with the environment can never be isolated from our relationship with others and with God. Otherwise, it will be nothing more than a romantic individualism dressed up in ecological gap, locking us into a stifling immanence, end quote. In my view, without recognizing this interdependence of forces between human persons and the cosmos, which allows one to affect and influence the other, climate justice risks serving only the interest of the rich and the powerful. Such is the intensity of this vital connection, or in Francis's terms, integral ecology, that one can only save oneself by saving the cosmos. This ecological interdependence is reinforced by the principles of preference of love for the poor the common good, and solidarity, and underscores the fact that human environment and the natural environment will deteriorate together. We cannot adequately combat environmental degradation unless we attend to causes relating to human and social degradation. That's a quote from Laudato Si. Laudate Deum. 
praise God. Because individually and collectively, we are not beholden to ecological violence. We are not beholden to ecological violence. We can chart a different course, a path of consistent ethics of solidarity, a culture of care, and a spirituality of ecological safeguarding. And for a healthy ecology to thrive, I find the narrative of Ubuntu more compelling than the technocratic paradigm in that it allows humans to interact with their environment without destroying it or endangering it. In the context of the present ecological crisis, the commitment to healing the earth, I believe, must now shift from the narrative of the threat of destruction to proclaiming the imperatives of drastic and intense action towards ecological salvation. That is a commitment by all to comprehensive decarbonization, fossil fuel non-proliferation, and grant-based climate financing to prevent even greater evils over time. The ecological crisis of our times, I believe, summons us to become advocates and practitioners of climate justice rooted in ecological Ubuntu. We run an existential risk if we outsource this endeavor to politicians, to technocrats, to lobbyists, and carbon traders. No one can be a bystander in today's ecological drama. And that is why Francis would encourage us to become protagonists of small, everyday things and the little, everyday gestures. Practitioners of simple, daily gestures and small gestures of mutual care. Francis, I believe, deserves the final word. He writes in Gaudete e Exultate, in salvation history, the Lord saved one people. We are never completely ourselves unless we belong to our people. That is why no one can be saved alone, as an isolated individual. Rather, God draws us to God's self, taking account of the complex fabric of interpersonal relationships present in human community. A question, a question. Does the possibility of resurrection exist for a destroyed planet? Yes. Yes. With God, all things are possible. Sadly, though, we would have squandered our only precious chance to join the chorus of the earth and the skies, the land and the seas, the flowers and the trees telling of the glory of God. And that's it. Well, thank you so much, Father Orabator. That was stunning. Stunning. You've given us a richness that I think we will spend some time absorbing. But in the few minutes that we have left, I'm sure there are some questions, in fact, I know there are, that people would like to ask. I just want to comment that I think the concept of ecological Ubuntu is incredibly powerful. Um, Ubuntu, in my understanding, is about the concept that none of us exist alone. We all exist because of one another. 
There is no me, there is no you. I exist because you exist. We are one. There is no other, which is very, very powerful. And you've given us a whole new dimension to that. So, Father Orobator, if you're okay, we might see if we have a few questions and uh, take a round or two, if that's okay. Um, okay, so maybe firstly, these questions come from the audience or possibly people online. What do you see as the role of the church in addressing the ecological crisis? And I'm going to add to that question, actually, because that is a huge question. And maybe, in the spirit of all good competency-based interviews, if you could give us an example of where you have seen the church doing what you propose very strongly, which is really around the imperative of drastic and intense action. Let me choose one other one, because that's quite big. Um, in terms of an ecological Ubuntu, what is now necessary from the global north in order to achieve this? What does this look like? So I think this question is about what is the responsibility here in the global north? So we have one question on the church and one question about our responsibility in the global north. And here's a very interesting one. Okay, this is the last one, I promise, Father Orobator, <laughs> and then we'll go back to the audience. What is climate justice in the digital age? We have raw materials in our phones, in our electric cars, on our roofs, and we know this, that come from the forgotten parts of the Democratic Republic of Congo. So we know that conflict is being driven by the extraction of resources in desperately exploitative conditions that provide our need to have renewable energy. That is a huge moral question. And maybe just what is your reflection on that? Is that enough? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, the role of the church um, in this climate uh, change uh, conversation, I think, you know, it's, if I would just stay, stick with the, the local context here, and if you consider the work that Trocar does, um, and, and the fact that this year uh, the organization is focusing on, on Malawi, um, for me, I mean, that's, that's a very concrete example of, where, how, of how the church as a community can be so rooted in the local context and therefore promote agency and voice and participation and local action. Because when you look at the way the conversation unfolds, you can become caught up in those big high level, macro level intervention, which is very, very important, you know, the COP, the cops and, and the many, many cops that we have. But there is the critical importance of making sure that first we are tapping into local wisdom and that we're actually empowering local action and actually looking at ways of making impactful changes in the lives of people, even if it's one person at a time, a Malita, a Patricia, a Patrick. It makes all the difference. And I think as an organization, well, as a community, we are best suited to do that. Because by definition, we are a people. We are a people of God. And that's not a theological abstraction. It is a concrete reality. And we see that in the work that, um, that, um, that Quiver and Tolker uh, describes for us um, um, today. So I think the examples abound. I would just leave it at that. Ecological Ubuntu, what's necessary for us in the West? Um, well, far be it for me to prescribe, you know, um, but some, Francis says something in Laudate Deum, which I referred to in a previous conversation this morning. He says, there's no such a thing as a lesser damage. Small damages accrue and accumulate. I think it behooves us, wherever we are situated, global south or global north, to begin to ask those, those questions about our own role in making a difference. The choices we make, the options we take. I happen presently to be living in a context where it's, it's expected that everybody would have a vehicle, a car, and then we'll complain about traffic congestion. But are there choices we can make 
on personal levels. In terms of lifestyle, choices that I believe might sound somewhat ridiculous, but at least they call to conscience our responsibility for making a change. I remember I lived in a community in Nairobi of six Jesuits when suddenly one of us announced that he was now a vegan. Of course, he was making a choice based on his conviction about climate justice. But the rest of us thought, hang on, we take turns to cook, and he's just decided he's a vegan. Have you ever imagined what it takes to cook for six people, and one of them is a vegan? You have to figure out how to prepare something. I, I, make, I make pizza. So how do I make pizza and make a vegan option without making two pizzas? So I had to carve out a kind of a triangle, you know, and section. I called it a green zone in my pizza. That's for him. But the point is, there are choices we can make. It can be uncomfortable, but also we can bring to the attention of people who are responsible for policies and decisions at various levels, our concerns. And I think that's, that's one of the advantages we still have in the global north, that we are still able to impact and influence government policies and decisions by what we do, by the actions we take. And that's important. The last question was about climate justice in a digital age. And you state it very clearly, that a lot of the, the digital development that we are so enamored by and caught up in simply drives at very local context conflicts. We have expressions like um, 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 blood diamond, you know, extraction of coltan from Eastern DRC and what that is doing to people. Of course, we need our cell phones. Of course, we need our laptops. But even at that, I do believe that we can make choices about how we engage with technology, whether technology becomes what drives us or we are the ones who drive technology. You know, I live in a context where you're expected to replace your, your, your smartphones upgrade your smartphones every year. Who needs that? If I have one that is marked seven, who said that next year I should have one that is eight and the following year nine and the following year 10? We all get caught up in that, but if we make those kinds of choices, it raises awareness, it signals our priorities, and hopefully shapes directions that we take as a society. And I think there's something, and I, I say this because I think one of the saddest things that could happen to us is for us to become despondent and helpless. And I know I'm speaking to the crowd, the, the choir here. I really know that. But we have to remind ourselves that we cannot become helpless. We cannot despair. There are prophetic actions that we take. There are prophetic decisions we take. There are prophetic options we take, which at the very least signals where our values and our priorities lie. And who knows what can happen after that. Think of Thunberg, Greta Thunberg who always tells us nobody's too small to make a difference. Thank you, for Father Robertar. That was just, again, immensely inspiring and deeply insightful. Um, I'm just going to see, we don't have long left, but I'm just going to see, is there anybody in the audience, present or online, who would love to ask a question while we still have the opportunity? I see one hand here. Great. Yeah. And would you mind just saying maybe your name? And if you're affiliated with an organization, you might say so. And I'm, just, I'm just struck that you use the, the um, Ubuntu, I am, because we are. Um, and you know that those two things, everything is connected and no one is saved alone. Um, and it just strikes me that um, you can't 
integrate either Laudato Si or Laudato Deum without looking to the corpus of Pope Francis's work, and particularly Fratelli Tutti. And just could you speak something into that about um, how we look at community and fraternity and social cohesion and how important that is when we think of ecological Ubuntu as well? Thank you. Thank you very much. Just to make sure I, I heard had your questions correctly. Um, but as you say, uh, Francis has a, an integral vision of life, um, and it's, it's all connected. Uh, one of the things I could have talked about, which I think there's still room to, to expand, is you know the whole idea that is contained in Fratelli Tutti, his whole idea of, of, of encounter, a culture of encounter. You know, there is also underlying that a very deeply ecological sensitivity you know, the encounter not only of peoples, but also within their environments, within their context. You know, and all of this come together, uh, I believe, um, as part of his integral, integral ecology. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Father Orobator. And I'm just scanning for questions. I see one hand over there, and then I'm going to ask one final question from the, oh, sorry, the lady behind. OK, these will be the two last questions then. So the gentleman there beside Marianne and the lady behind with the blue folder. Jeremy Corley, St. Patrick's. Artificial intelligence, AI, is regarded as a big new thing today. And yet I was struck by what you said about the need for affect and being moved. And artificial intelligence doesn't have that. So sometimes people look to that as solving all the world's problems. But I think climate change, from what you said, needs the human feeling. And so artificial intelligence perhaps is limited there. I don't know whether you'd like to comment on that. No, I totally I would agree with you, and I think that's very important. Um, again, this, it, it goes back to this, what Francis tells us or what says about a technocratic paradigm, thinking that we will solve everything through technology, and technology would give us an unlimited capacity to use and misuse. I think that's a direction we have to consciously begin to reflect on and remind ourselves that at the end of the day, you know, artificial intelligence is artificial. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then the lady here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, um, like, how do you think that uh, we can convince um, many Catholic Christians that still see climate justice as an add-on, either because they are too busy kind of working in, in social justice, you know, other issues of oppression and injustice, or because they see faith as something personal between God and themselves, mm -hmm. and then uh, they see climate justice as a frill, you know, and that's a question, and then unite to that. Do you think if we eventually get all those people in, would climate justice be the glue that would gel the Catholic Church together? I like that second idea, and, and I don't want to say that um, I have any original thoughts on that right now, but the way you put it, that this might become the glue that binds all of our understanding of, of, of justice. I think there's something there that is quite original. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, but the question about added on, being an added on, I think that's even a lesser challenge than the lack of, um, the, re the refusal to believe that we even have a problem, that we're dealing with a crisis. That's an even deeper challenge. You know, and I think if, if, we, if we can resolve that, by constantly not only referencing materials that are scientifically based or evidence, but also telling stories. And this is why I find the approach of Trocker very unique. Narratives are important. I mean, we can talk about existential threat, you know? We can talk about atmospheric calamities, big words. But what does that look like in the life of a Malita in a village in Malawi 
What does that look like for the future of a Patrick or a Patricia in the village of Malawi? Telling those stories, narratives are important. And that's why I was trying to suggest that this narrative of Ubuntu can help us push that message further, that this is not an intellectual debate. We're not trying to win an argument. We're trying to save lives. It's about salvation. And that's the good news. Father Orobatra, thank you so much. I'm afraid we're coming to the end now, so we don't have time to look for more questions. But it has been an absolute honor and fascinating to listen to you. I think we've all been brought to a whole new level, to be honest, much as we do spend a lot of time, I'm sure everybody in this audience and online, spends time thinking and reflecting about climate justice, about our own role, our role in the community, our role in our families, our role in our workplace, our role in our entire environment. And I think a lot of what you said is going to stay with us. Everybody will take their own personal wealth from what we've heard this evening. For me, I think I will take the concept of ecological Ubuntu and really think about that and try and deepen that concept because I think it's, it's really profound and it's really transformational. You know, it really affects the way you think and the way you view the world. But I think you've also given us something really concrete. Those of us who really found our work on Catholic social teaching, you've expressed that, that you propose that there are three principles that are the foundations for true climate justice, not a justice that's transactional, not a justice in your words, which basically amounts to horse trading at the annual COP conference, but a justice that's really rooted in human dignity. The preference of love for the poor, the paramountcy of the common good, and the urgency of solidarity. And solidarity is one of Trocra's five core values. It's something we try to live by every day. So I was particularly, I suppose, moved and touched by everything that you said about solidarity, including that solidarity is a human capacity to be affected by the condition of others and the concomitant imperative to act. And that is fundamental because solidarity, as you mentioned in much finer words, is not just about feeling some kind of you know, vague compassion or some sort of disembodied sense of, gosh, that's dreadful. But it is actually about enacting that, that sense and really truly living our faith it does require us to act, but those can be small acts. We don't, don't all have to be the policy makers who stand on the global stage, but we have to enable the space for people to become influencers, whether it's the climate students in Malawi that Trokra has worked alongside for five, six years so that they're at the stage that they can influence their society, their government, and even also be present at the COP, giving a different perspective, that human perspective on what is happening. So Father Orobator, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of Trokra, and I would like to also thank St. Patrick's College and all of the staff of the college who make this event possible every year. I'd like to thank all of you, our audience, here present and online. I'd like to promise you that we will circulate Father Orobator's speech as soon as possible. And I'm sure you will want to do this, but it merits so much reflection and it merits sharing widely. Um, so we'll be in touch with you very soon on that. And in the interim, I would like to invite you to give Father Orobator another big round of applause. Thank you. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I and I would like to I would like to thank Trucker for the invitation to share these thoughts with you. I was privileged to do this ten years ago, and it's good to be back and thank Quiver and her team for a wonderful job. And as, you, as was asked, you know, what difference, how can we make a difference? I can tell you that the work that Trucker does makes a difference. And therefore, to the extent that we are supporting these kinds of initiatives in our own little ways here, we're making a difference. Uh, many of us, practically most of us, will never meet Melita, would never meet Patricia, would never meet Patrick, but their lives will be different because of the choices and the actions we take to support the work that Trucker does. So thank you very much. Appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you.